All right, Super Brain, what's going on? And uh, what are some of your initial thoughts about the sugar diet, sugar fasting that I have going on? Well, you know me, I've been Super Brain and doing a lot of cool stuff. Um, the nonprofit, which I've told you about extensively in the last year, uh, is doing a soft launch this weekend, a hard launch in the upcoming, which will be cool. Um, as you know, I've been doing a little bit of the sugar diet, if you will, for a while now as like uh, in my new adult phase of eating and dieting, if you will. Because back when I was cutting for Strongman and the Performance Vibe was a big coaching platform, uh, something similar is how we did all of our weight cuts. Like at the very end, you would bring the protein down, the essential fats down as well, but very targeted in when and how you'd eat them. And then going the, I used to use the 80-20 rule. You're either gonna go 80% fruit, 20% sugar, or invert that 80-20 for your energy based on what you're doing during the day. And uh, had a lot of successful weight cuts that way. And it was funny, we approached it that way for performance right? It was like, this is how you train hard still, get the recovery done and move on. And it's been a different ride in the sense of like, I always did that to make weight. And then if you weren't cutting weight, you weren't eating that way uh, mm -hmm. for that time being. So it's been fun, like kind of circling back later in life. The, uh, you know, let's talk, I want to talk to you. And one of the reasons I want to talk to you specifically is like, I just feel like you know a lot about organs and organ health and organ optimization. Because when you and I have worked together in the past and even more recently where you've just made suggestions to me and so forth. You talk a lot about like blood pressure and just, just health, like health, health optimization alongside of, uh, performance optimization. And I always say like, you're the ultimate amplifier. You're able to like, look at a situation and then you're able to amplify it, but you also think of the consequences. So I think it's really important to point out with people, sugar diet, sugar fasting, these different protocols that we use for fat loss, for weight loss, it might not be a good idea to do them in perpetuity. Like it might not be a good idea to do them forever. And I, I've been on a long journey down from 330, but it started, uh, you know, 12 years ago. So I think 12 years is like a reasonable amount to uh, work on losing, you know, over 130 pounds. But anyway, I wanted to get into this idea of, if you can explain kind of what's happening, you think with this diet in terms of the liver, because it seems like we're putting some stress and some um, uh, just, I guess, pressure, you'd say, maybe on the liver in a way. Um, but then that's giving us like a pretty good amplified reaction in the right direction for now. Yeah, I think the first thing with all diets we need to keep in mind is especially when the goal is to get weight off relatively quick, you are putting some type of like compensatory actions in play like you're doing something hard on your body on purpose and it might just have a positive connotation because you're choosing to do it to yourself but that comes in everything so every compensation you will that you're looking for in a diet is more fat loss more usage of that fat when it comes out of the adipocyte and hopefully doing it in an effective and efficient enough manner that we don't restore those liberated triglycerides from the adipocyte back in your body. That's the goal of every single fat loss diet ever. And you could get there in many different ways. So I think the first thing to recognize with like a carbohydrate based diet, which is probably the more accurate term, if you will, um, is that when we are eating, let's say a lot of fructose at once. There's been a lot of studies done and just general textbook information as well on what does it look like when we digest 30 to 50 grams of fructose at once, which is a good bit. For example, I think an apple is like five or six grams of fructose on average. You know, it's all like depending on the apple and the size and when you picked it. But let's just say randomly there, five. If you have juice, you'll get there faster. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's like six apples, let's say, at least, if not 10 apples, like 30 to 50 grams of fructose is a lot. And there's stages that we're going to go through and I'll kind of run through them real quick. First is in like the small intestine and the enterocyte. Um, let's say we had 50. We're going to lose, it's called escaping, roughly 15% of that initial 50, in what we call the first pass through, and it has to do with going through the liver and everything. But the small intestine is where food utilization for the majority of everything really goes down. We have two really important enzymes here that are going to be universal in the liver and in the enterocyte. We have ketohexokinase and we have fructose 1-phosphate. 
Now, these are crucial enzymes, just like any other enzyme, right? If you're trying to lose weight, you want fat loss, you want hormone-sensitive lipase to do a lot of work for you, enzymes are crucial. Not having enough enzymes, which we will talk about later, is the barrier of entry for, say, the diet here. Things go wrong when we can't do what we're supposed to do. So I'm covering what's supposed to happen when you eat a ton of fructose. Most of it comes through after that, goes through the portal vein, and then when we get to the liver is where we get some more good stuff. In the enterocyte, we get some glucose and some other potential energy, but it has to go through that again, like I said, into the portal vein, the liver. At the end phase of this absorption in the liver, that's where we get carbon dioxide and ATP. We can store it as glycogen. We can go through de novo lipogenesis, which is the production of triglycerides from endogenous or other materials, and we can subsidize our glucose levels. The reason this is really cool is because normally when we eat sugar, it's more unregulated and glucose in general is unregulated. We can go from very small millimoles to very large millimoles in our blood. Whereas with fructose, even with that large amount of 30 to 50 grams, it never really changes above one millimole. 0.2 is your average. So let's say the whole range for fructose consumption might only change fivefold. Whereas glucose, as we know, your glucose levels can get up three, four, five hundreds, you know, in, in some diabetic patients. So the range just being tighter tells us the body is probably more effective and efficient at handling it if everything goes right in a surplus state. Plus, we also have the Cori cycle. Good old Cori cycle is the usage of glucose and lactate, like in a circle, if you will between the muscles and the liver. So as that liver gets better at doing all the liver jobs, it can create a relationship with the muscles and physical activity that might be even better than, you know, it's part of the problem with a lot of people on low carb dieting is exercising and being physically active, where if you experience those symptoms, uh, the carbohydrate based diet can alleviate that for you in a lot of ways. Yeah, I know, you know, people probably don't realize this, but your side gig, you are a comedian and you uh, <laughs> you left a funny joke on my uh, on my one of my Instagram posts. You wrote de novo lipogenesis and I had a good laugh, but most people <laughs> most people don't understand your humor. Now, what is de novo lipogenesis? And like because, you know, my understanding of it is it, you are kind of tor turning, uh, I guess, carbohydrates or maybe in this case, glucose uh, into fatty acids. And that sounds like bad news. That sounds like bad news for most people because isn't that sort of the start sometimes of like fatty liver? And isn't that sometimes the starting place of diabetes? But maybe that's not the case with what we're doing because our protein is low and our fats are low. It's more of what we have to call the fates of it. There's no absolutes in biology or health or really life at all, right? There's never a hundred percent success of failure or guaranteed success, right? There is no absolute. So if you had zero glucose, we can't even get there in the first place. 40, 30 is really where people start to pass out for the most part. Same with triglycerides. You can't get that to zero. And we know that having it ultra, ultra low is probably not super good. Having it ultra high is not great either. But what we want is, and this is again, going back to the goal of every diet, is to be able to handle the energy, which is carbs and fats. Protein doesn't do a whole lot for energy. We want to be able to handle the energy we take in optimally because obviously we want to we need to eat food for energy but the goal of fat loss is to burn a little bit of what you got and that's why it tends to be a good idea to either pick fats or pick carbs especially if you're early on or you're struggling you know uh to eat the balanced diet balanced diets are great for people who've been killing it for years and may not have extreme goals but that's actually an incredibly small amount of the population most people who are killing it have extreme goals and most people who are trying to get somewhere aren't already killing it you know it's also just easy to kind of go through different ways of eating throughout the year every few years like you've said smelly so when it comes to the carbohydrate based diet here the thing you need to get in check and understanding de novo lipogenesis is i need to produce triglycerides because i'm probably not eating a ton of them the ones that are likely in my blood are either from circulating adipocytes or fat cells that I've liberated with hormone sensitive lipase and norepinephrine or de novo lipogenesis. So let's say you're on a low carb diet. We're doing a version of de novo lipogenesis 
if you will, for sugars. We have to produce what we don't have. And that, like I said, sometimes a good thing, compensatory adaptation is what's helping you get the fat off uh, in both scenarios. So de novo lipogenesis, to sh shorten up that answer, is the production of a triglyceride from a non-triglyceride source because you did not consume it. How would you hack this, uh, this particular diet protocol for people that are kind of looking at it and they, A, they just, they, they don't want to do it. They don't want to like commit to it, but they want to try like some version of it. You know, so, some of the things I'm recommending are people to, to, you know, the beginning of the day, you know, and it, once it becomes, uh, you know, dinner time, they can break the sugar fast with, you know, a lean meat and some starch. How, you know, when you start thinking about these things, you start thinking about people working out and wanting to hold on to muscle, how would Superbrain go about hacking some of this uh, and still keeping it optimal while somebody could still potentially lose some weight? I think the big part there is barrier of entry, right? Like the barrier of entry for ultra low carb dieting is a little lower and that as long as you get it in, the physical activity is a wonderful amplifier, but not quite necessary per se. This diet gets drastically more potent when you can combine that type of stuff with exercise. So the reason it worked for well, so well for weight cutting and getting lean with my strongman powerlifting and bodybuilding clients back in the day when we used it was because it wasn't a question as if you're going to train less. It was like, hey, now this is just what you're eating instead. You still have the stuff to do. You still have to hit the gym, do your jumps, and do your cardio. If you can do that and you're already used to physical activity at least five to seven days a week, that's more than half the battle. Uh, once you're in that state, I think it's important to make sure that you're never killing yourself and you're living to fight another day because exercising and the glucose up and down effect of the sugar style diet or the low fat carbohydrate diet is going to benefit hormonally, enzymatically, and in every way from exercise, which is essentially in all senses, especially resistance training, pulling sugar away from your liver and muscles. So as we've talked about Smelly, I believe in the two coin theory, your training and nutrition should be synergistic. If you're eating carbs, you should be doing some type of carbohydrate based exercise, which matches well with what most people think is a good idea. Like not everyone goes for a long run and gets the feeling of someone who enjoys that. Most people feel like they've done something just if they work as hard as they can and are pouring sweat. So if you do some random hit work and go work out hard 20 reps at a time in the gym for 40 minutes only, let's say, or even 30 minutes, that's drastically amplifying your carbohydrate or sugar diet, if you will, uh, because of their synergy, like I've spoken about in the past. And I think that's one of the fantastic ways to do it. Along with that, chromium is going to be the most important mineral for this diet. It's the mineral cofactor for the insulin receptor. Not that insulin is mega high here, depending on how you eat, but more importantly, it's like that crucial support WD-40 for the squeaky door that you're using quite often, right? So chromium will also let you eat more and exercise more because no one can exercise a lot on just ultra low food in the first place. Nice thing about carbohydrate diets are that you could kind of eat a little more food, especially because the protein needs don't have to be quite as high as they do to match out some of the low carb pros and cons. So then you can do some really cool exercise, do it often, and only get more benefits.